Hey guys, I'm so honored to be in the office of the Center for Shared Insight with Dr. Brittany Wolford. How are you today? I'm doing well. Awesome. So this is like my epicenter of my nerd <laughs> life, uh, where like Dr. Hick and Dr. Wolford and <laughs> Dr. Blake are all like attachment theory gurus. But we wanted to cover like a lot of different ways that attachment styles impact life. So today we're like going to dive all in on attachment style and sexuality and yeah. and sex with our partner. Yeah. So if you if you're okay with that, let's just jump right in with a quote. So we talked, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm looking at the camera. We talked on Friday and I pulled out this quote. I don't know if it was me that said it. I think it was you that said it. I don't remember saying it. <laughs> it's just a combination, both of us. And it goes like this. If we don't have healthy attachments, we won't have healthy sex. Yeah. And I want to start there. Yeah. Like, what does that mean to you? First of all, let's talk about this and then we'll talk about why you, why okay. you just love this stuff. Okay. But, uh, I think that like what we talked about, you're gonna use sex as a way for connection or disconnection based on some of your attachment and beliefs about relationships and yourself and others. Like, am I good? Are they good? And if I'm not feeling good about myself, I'm gonna use it to make myself feel better. Okay. If I don't trust them, I'm gonna make sure I feel good and like distance myself with sex. And you're talking about an avoidant attachment style there. Yeah, yeah. and. If you're secure and you have a good attachment, then you're going to be able to engage and have healthy communication and use it as a way of connection and all the other ways that sex can be used in like a very consensual way to like build up your relationship. Mm -hmm. So what is it about attachment style and how is it that you decided mm -hmm. that uh, being a doctor of psychology was your path and your mission in life? Yeah, so I'm a weirdo where like seventh grade was when I found out this is what I wanted to do. <laughs> uh, I had like a friend, Julie and Drew, who were destined to be together, but not. And it was just terrible. Do they uh, <laughs> stay together, break up, stay no, together, break up? I don't up. even think it even actually started because this was seventh grade. <laughs> I don't think anything actually started, but it was like the end of their world. Uh, but like, I'm still really good friends with Julie, but, uh, and I tell her this story, but um. And afterwards, she's like, that was great, because like, I was helping out, helping her out with that. And she's like, that was great, you should do that as a job. And I was like, huh, okay. And now here I am, some odd years later, yep. <laughs> still doing it. Um, and then I grew up in a military family, and I grew up um, around military bases, and I think also like family structures and relationships. So not just romantic, but like family and friendship when you have people moving in and out every three years, like what that looks like, and my parents are gone for so many months. Um, and I just found myself being like super curious of like how do relationships actually work. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about this a lot in your too, like we're never really taught how to be in healthy relationships. Um, and so again, just complete utter nerd, like even in undergrad, every class I took, I would make all like the essays you're required to write about relationships. Um, so it's like everything all the time. Um, and then when I was actually looking for grad schools, you had to like pick something and I was really begrudging that. And then I found attachment theory and I was like, oh, huh, that like fits all of my experiences of what I've learned about relationships. Sure. It yeah. kind of lit up the light bulb for you. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think with sex, like one, if you're going to do couples therapy, like you have to be super comfortable talking about sex, like, cause you're going to be entering into people's intimate sex lives you're gonna be invited in there um, and if you're uncomfortable about it it's not just gonna make your clients uncomfortable about it um, and then actually it was like doing research on military sexual trauma and looking into attachment and just you would think attachment and sex would be so much research on it but there's really not just on sexuality in general because it's so hard to get funding for like this topic mm -hmm. right um, and then there's the other piece of being like female and I was recognizing when I do research on this <laughs> presentations and things like that there would just be a lot of weird glances and really inappropriate questions and um, so I also saw it as like an advocacy piece that I wanted to like be able to be a part of mm -hmm. it was a really long-winded story no I, I I love hearing why my expert guests are mm -hmm. passionate about what they do mm -hmm. and we're here specifically to talk about attachment styles and sex so mm -hmm. if we could go through like anxious and avoidant and secure and how they I think you said how they use sex yeah yeah so let's start with um, anxious anxious 
Yeah, so people who have an anxious attachment style, um, I'm sure most of your listeners already kind of know this, but how I always think about it is a view of yourself and others. So they view, I'm not good, others are good. So they're always trying to constantly earn that love. So they're more likely to be feel coerced into sex or feel like they have to have sex, um, feel like they are trying to use it to get love and attention. They're also the least likely to feel they have the power to negotiate like condom use. And things like that and then once they're in a relationship they use sex as a barometer so the relationship between like sexual satisfaction and relationship satisfaction is like through the roof for okay. anxious um, people who, up, who have that attachment style because they're just constantly worried like if we're not having sex if we're having too much sex what's the exact number of times we should be having sex with my partner how many times have they come like all these like questions constantly mm -hmm. running through their head because remember like they're good so they're obviously going to leave me and i'm not good so i gotta like do all these things with sex um so they're also likely to have their first time sex be at a younger age um, have more sexual partners and engage more risky sexual behaviors okay so just to ask a clarifying question, where would that type of anxious attachment style come from? Maybe in the yeah. realm of um, childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is either like inconsistent parenting, so either parents are there and then they're not, and so then you're like, I don't know when this is gonna come, and so like, I gotta try and get as much attention that I can, even positive or negative. So it could be um, like a parent who is struggling with their own mental health and maybe is not as available um, or travels a lot or maybe there's some divorce stuff happening where a parent is like no longer in the picture, those type of things. Um, and then it also can be like the helicopter parent that is like all over their child and like tells them to do everything exactly and constantly like really involved. Because um, if you think about it, what lesson that child's learning is I'm not good enough to take care of myself, other people have to take care of me. Mm -hmm. So that would be what like the parent um, relationship would look like. Okay. Um, and then because they do have that, they're trying to constantly earn that, they might be a little bit more needy, they're going to be constantly in relationships. So later on, the relationships that they're in, they're going to get broken up with a lot. They're, all, they're the person who is typically the one broken up with. Oh, got it. Um, and, and so it kind of reinforces this idea, yeah. I'm not good. And from childhood to adulthood, we seek what's familiar. Yeah. And that's why understanding our mm -hmm. self and our partner's attachment style mm -hmm. is so important. Yeah. Especially with the anxious attachment mm -hmm. because the connotation is needy and clingy. Yeah. I think is like the most mm -hmm. commonly used descriptors mm -hmm. for the anxious yeah. attachment. Yeah. But uh, anything else to say about anxious attachment and sex and a little bit about the mindset and what they use it for? Yeah, I guess, I guess just, yeah, they're using it to gain like approval and love and that's how they view sex and I think it makes it hard. So avoidant and anxious have the lowest sexual satisfaction. So if you're constantly like trying to guess like how my partner felt during that interaction and you're not worried about your sexual needs and not feeling, feeling fulfilled, it's obviously gonna relate to like lower sexual satisfaction later on. Totally relatable. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now how does an avoidant attachment style use sex. Yeah, so they are more likely to have actually a later onset of first sexual partner, uh, but they're much more comfortable with casual sex. And will have multiple partners and will not feel as like, it won't be as difficult for them to like have sex with someone and then not talk to them again. Mm -hmm. Or like have the relationship end after that. Where someone who is anxious is like, I just did all this to make you love me and now you're breaking up with me and it's just like, <laughs> chaos um, but someone who is more avoidant is like well, okay I'm getting my physical needs met and remember these folks are people that don't like intimacy or are uncomfortable with intimacy and so they might be like this is great I feel great physically like I don't want anything more <laughs> maybe less cuddle time that's not research based that's just <laughs> Something I would think that would happen is like less of that, like probably less foreplay, less like cuddling, less things we think about that brings more like intimacy mm -hmm. into sex. I hear that person in my mind kind of saying a phrase, maybe like, I like having sex with my partner, but it's not yeah. highest on my priority list. Yeah, yeah, so that's a great point. So they actually, sexual satisfaction or relationship, bleh, relationship satisfaction is actually not highly correlated. For an avoidant um, attachment. Yeah, so they could be like their relationship could be going along fine and then like 
their sex life isn't that great, but it wouldn't really impact their relationship. Mm -hmm. She's like, it's just this other thing there. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we yeah we have sex. It's kind of be. <laughs> it wouldn't be like it's this m amazing like mind blowing like anything like that. And then uh, finally, uh, how does a secure attachment style view and use sex? Yeah, so they, so someone with a secure attachment is more likely to have long-term committed relationships. So they're going to have lower numbers of sexual partners because they're probably, if, there's only so many years in your life that if you're in longer committed relationships, you're not sleeping around as much. Um, they have later onset of first sexual partner, um, a lot more open communication. They feel connected with their partner about sex. Um, and feel confident about their sex life. Um, so yeah, just like a very, what we'd all want in our sex life. They have the highest sexual satisfaction, feel totally comfortable talking to their partner, um, and like they don't really necessarily want to have casual sex, because they just, that doesn't feel comfortable or safe mm -hmm. for them. They're... And where's their correlation on sexual satisfaction and relationship satisfaction? Um, so it's in between the avoidant and the anxious. Okay. Because avoidance is like, nah, it doesn't really matter. On a straight um, line or on like a bell curve? <laughs> if we want to go nerdy. <laughs> I could not tell you. I could make something up, but. <laughs> no, we're going to, we're going to get to the quadrant a little oh, okay. bit later. And okay. I just wanted to kind of like tease mm. the science scene because I, yeah. I just absolutely love it. So let's say that like one of these three get into a relationship mm with another and we, yeah. we were describing it as like the push and the pull in a relationship so let's yeah. pair an anxious and an avoidant together mm -hmm. and how that relates to sex yeah yeah so what do you like with what we just talked about i want to give you a chance to talk because i feel like i've been talking so much. no that's that's <laughs> the reason why so like um the the one thing that's coming to my mind mm -hmm. is that i was an avoidant attachment style mm -hmm. for years mm -hmm. and what i've always encouraged our audience to know yeah. is that there's hope like yeah. you don't have to stay there like with mm -hmm. self-awareness and personal discovery, mm -hmm. you can come closer to having a secure attachment style yeah. with work. Yeah, yeah, it does. It takes a lot of work, and I think I, we talked about last time we talked of how like we are experts on this, but when our own attachment stuff is flaring <laughs> up, we can't see it, right? You can study and read as much as you want, but unless you have like someone from an outside perspective, when our attachment alarm bells are going mm -hmm. off, like. You're just you're you're walking through it blind, right? Yeah. For me, uh, for me, because I've intentionally done work, I mm -hmm. hated being an avoidant attachment. It was almost mm -hmm. like, it was almost like my alignment was off. Everything was shifted to the left, my six feet from center. Yeah. You know, and when I am secure, and when I am feeling aligned, any deviation from that center mm -hmm. is a is a signal flare for me. Yeah, it's like. That's my gut instinct saying, mm -hmm. Dave, you're either responding to an anxious or an avoidant attachment style and you're becoming like this, watch out for X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So I don't want to call it an algorithm, but that's really what happens for me when the gut instinct mm -hmm. kicks in mm -hmm. and I'm like, I enjoy spending time with this person, but I'm seeing these three things in me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think too, we have to put it in context with our life also. So again, if we think about it as like, um, people who are avoidant are like, I'm good, other people aren't, so I'm just gonna figure it all out on my own. So if also with work, like something comes up that shakes your confidence, like something else in your life shakes your confidence and you're feeling less like safe and you're like, I'm great, you're not, mm -hmm. right? That might pull a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, or if you're just feeling you're on top of the world, you're really busy, all of that, I can do everything on my own, like it's great, like you might be more pulled to be like in that like, y'all need to figure out your stuff. I'm doing great over here. <laughs> now, uh, we didn't touch on where the avoidant attachment style comes mm -hmm. from in childhood. Yeah. So, yeah. and now that you bring up, I'm good, y'all need to take care of yourself. Where does yeah. that come from? Yeah, so you learn that your parents are not available, that you need to do what you need to do to get your needs met. Um, and so with me, like I have a little bit more of the avoidant flavor, and I think a lot of that comes in military culture of just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, figure it all out um, on your own, get it done. Um, just a very much that piece of mindset, which if you think about it from like survival standpoint, if you are in the military, like you need to have some of that. Um, so yeah, so I think cultural influences. So we also can be nerdy about 
where you are culturally. So in America, being avoidantly attached is so reinforced. Isn't it though? Yeah. Like corporate America, mm -hmm. um, even our, our family systems can uh, really yeah. encourage that as well. Yeah. Especially with boy, young boys, it's so much like, well, I don't want them to like need this. Like they need to be able to do this on their own, they figure it out on their own. Mm -hmm. Hear a lot of parents worrying, like I don't want to um, like coddle them in a way that's gonna later. When it's really like, no, like you're their parent for a sure. reason. You're supposed to be able to help them. So the parent's job, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is to become the healthiest and most secure version of themselves so that they're mm -hmm. not um, mm -hmm. creating these anxious and avoidant attachment yeah. styles in their children. But yeah. we're human, we're gonna make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I have a 17 year old daughter. I'm starting to see those um, <laughs> come back and reflect at me yeah. from my avoidant attachment style for mm -hmm. 20 years. Yeah. You know, so before we got off on a Sorry. tangent <laughs> and you asked me a question and I like to talk, so <laughs> if you give me that chance, I will. Um, we are gonna talk about anxious and avoidant mm -hmm. in a relationship together yeah. and their sexual not compatibility, mm -hmm. but relationship. Yeah, yeah, so something else I don't think you've talked about yet, and remind me if you like have an earlier episode, it's like pursuer distancer type. No, let's yeah. do it. All right, so this is the other thing mm -hmm. that happens a lot with attachment styles, and like I'm gonna use my hand, so like you have someone If you're not who, watching this on YouTube, <laughs> yeah, you need no. to. <laughs> so, if you have someone who's like more anxiously attached, like when they get upset, they amp up, and they wanna talk about it now, they wanna figure it out, they like want all that. And this avoidant person sees that and they're like, oh my gosh, I need to pull away. This person is just amped up. Mm -hmm. So then they pull away and then this anxious person feels them pulling away. So they amp up even uh -huh. more, right? So this can happen with sex. So say like someone who's feeling anxious, who's in a relationship with someone who's avoided is maybe feeling more insecure about the relationship. So all of a sudden they want to have sex all the time and their partner says no once and it's just like, Oh my gosh, they no longer in love with me. This means it's the end of the relationship. Kind of thoughts like mm -hmm. this. Or like, is there something wrong with my body? Am I not pleasing them? Like, no, but it's just like, I was just tired. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the correlation mm -hmm. between sexual satisfaction and relationship satisfaction. Mm -hmm. That's like the perfect yeah. picture to paint mm -hmm. for that partnership and that relationship. Yeah. yeah. So then all of a sudden they are like more demanding with like sex and like they like, want to try out new things and like are getting really like building up about this and someone who's avoidant is like hold on like I like I don't want this pressure I'm feeling like you're needing a lot from me so again they back up more <laughs> so like these two people just start like amplifying their behaviors so you're talking about like this mm -hmm. pursuer distancer in like a fluid way so mm -hmm. it might not be their norm mm -hmm. behavior yeah. it's really in reaction to something mm -hmm. like you were talking about context Mm -hmm. If something happens in the work life of an anxious attached, yeah. guess what? Pursue, pursue, pursue. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Because they just, again, they're wanting to like reaffirm that, um, that piece. And that's how like avoidance get away with pulling away so much. And that's why they are attracted to people who are anxious. Because when they pull away, this person comes after them. So they're still getting their attachment needs met. They're feeling wanted and needed and they can pull away as much as they want. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. I have clients talk about this all the time of like they want that control. And it feels so much more in control in a relationship when that person likes you more than you like them. I think that's classic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, it hit home for me because of that history of an avoidant attachment mm -hmm. style. Um, yes, I swing on the pendulum, mm -hmm. or we're going to get to the quadrant here in a second, but um, it's fluid for me. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I'm in response mm -hmm. of my context and yeah. my, my environment. If I feel an anxious partner, mm -hmm. I will avoid the mm -hmm. pursuer distancer. Yeah. But not in the extremes of where I was, yeah. say like five yeah. years ago. Yeah, well and I think too we touched on a little bit of like, it's almost like, you know, anything like eating disorder, alcoholism, depression, like anxiety, all of that. It's not like we can work that away and it's gone for forever, right? There's always gonna be a piece of you that, like there's gonna be buttons that get pushed, that are gonna flare up those things. So that's so much you've talked about of like just knowing yourself like knowing like, ah, okay, I'm on that pendulum swing. Mm -hmm. What's going on here? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, I'm a little bit left or I'm a little bit right of center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my direction as the Enneagram 8 is like, oh, I found my goal. I'm going to go straight to it mm -hmm. with intensity and yeah. uh, conviction. Yeah. <laughs> and you can either join me or watch me. <laughs> yeah. So uh, 
Well, let's bring in the secure attachment style mm -hmm. with an anxious person. How does mm -hmm. their sex life look? Yeah. Well, I think like whenever you add like a secure person in, like you're going to hope that it actually like evens out what's happening in the insecure relationship. And that's a piece of what can help heal some of that attachment wounds. And that's why therapy is good. If you have a secure therapist, you can help. Um, if you can't find any secure people in your life, which is something that... Oftentimes, yeah. It's, it's the, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I told you I just got lost. That's all right. So we're talking about secure and anxious <laughs> in a relationship yes. and their sex life. Um, yeah, but as we've talked about, it depends how secure are they. Do they have some anxious tendencies and are they going to be more easily pulled into that dance with someone who's anxious? And then is someone super anxious where that secure person is now like, ooh, I want to pull back a little bit. Um, and so with sex, it could be, again, like that really wanting reassurance, affirmation, wanting sex often, and then when that secure person is trying to set boundaries, right, they feel that as rejection. Mm -hmm. And so then they get even more upset and they need more and more reassurance and kind of can get in this like a vicious cycle. Sure, and then how do we end that cycle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like with open communication, I think talking about it more um, with couples, it's I hear all the time, like it's so vulnerable to initiate sex with a partner. Um, and you'd think like, especially like being married, like for like so many years, like you'd be like, no problem initiating sex, but it can be so vulnerable. And for people with more of an anxious attachment style, when you say no once, it feels completely shut down. So I think talking about like, no, I, I really was tired. I still really sexually enjoy you. I want to have sex with you. All those things are really important to make sure that you're constantly communicating about. Um, where it could be unhealthy is that the secure person is like feeling overwhelmed and like this person is needy and being dramatic and just gets passive aggressive and stops initiating sex and pulls away, mm -hmm. right? Or the anxious person gets passive aggressive and tries to use sex in different ways, try to manipulate like how they're feeling. Um, and not telling their partner like, hey, when you said you didn't want to have sex last night, it felt like this to me. Is mm -hmm. that what you like were meaning? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cla uh, like such a great description of those yeah. two uh, partners together. Now, how about yeah. secure and, and avoidant? Yeah. What does their sex life look like? Yeah, I think um, it can look very similar again. So if that secure person is like way, way secure and they're like really firm in that, um, you know, they could really help heal some of that for an avoidant person of engaging in sex um, and being able to use sex as like intimacy in a relationship builder instead of just something to get baseline mm -hmm. needs met of like, mm -hmm. this can be a way of connection and I'm okay connecting with you in that way. It feels safe. Um, and again, the avoidant person could be pulling away more and that secure person could swing into that anxious okay. piece of like, again, needing reassurance, not knowing why they're not having sex as much, sure. um, all of that. Or like, again, that there's so many times I've been asked like, well, what is the ideal number of times you should have sex a week? <laughs> it's like, there's no magic number, I mm. promise. Yeah, because yeah. we have many, many, many different combinations mm -hmm. of uh, personality types. Yes, avoidant yeah. uh, attachment styles, but then yeah. we were talking about the Enneagram and we're talking yeah. about Myers-Briggs yeah. and all of these factors like we don't want to overanalyze ourselves because then we get paralysis by analysis. And that's <laughs> the last. Is that? Paralysis by analysis. It's a sports term ah. uh, where, like, uh, just players are overthinking mm -hmm. or the coaches are overthinking. Yeah. Um, overthinking is like a common theme for me because I'm very heady, but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you came with this whole podcast, so all you're doing is thinking about it. I'm sure. uh, and for a long time, like, I, I would get frustrated in Denver's dating scene. Mm -hmm. Um, because I've been actively dating for almost two years now mm -hmm. with a couple of short breaks in there when I needed yeah. it. But I almost thought too much about it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I've been asked that many, many times by yeah. my men's group and by a recent person that I dated. Mm -hmm. Dave, do you think that you know too much? Yeah. Well, when it comes down to it, I'm simply just learning mm -hmm. more about myself and I'm applying it to the dates that I go yeah. on. Yeah. And until I figured out, or until I read Attached by Amir Levine, I was stuck. Mm -hmm. Like, straight up stuck in, like, yeah. understand or not understanding why my last relationship ended. 
Yeah. And then I read it, and I'm like, oh, well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> duh, that just, yeah. Because okay. we were not both secure. I was still yeah. avoidant. Yeah. She was anxious. Mm -hmm. Polarity. Like, yeah. Or the pursuer. Um, and I think that's, like, a good thing, too, especially for, like, your listeners here, too, is, like, learning more about yourself, but also, like, practicing being in the moment and trying to not overthink it. It's, like, this huge balance that you want to keep. I'm getting better at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm only human, so, like... Oh, yeah, all the time, yeah. <laughs> well, and I think what we were talking about, too, like, when you learn more about attachment theory, you see it everywhere. Like, every single interaction, like, person who flips you off driving, mm -hmm. like, in, the, in traffic. You so we can like, apply this to our friendships yeah. as well as our romantic relationships, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. And there's actually, like, that's, like, where, like, the new emerging research is. Because it used to be, like, in the beginning, they're, like, by age six, your attachment style is cemented. It's never going to change. It is what it is. Your parents messed you up and mm -hmm. sucks to suck. I personally don't believe that. But yeah. before we get into the schools of thought, okay. yes. <laughs> uh, let's, let's, we've been alluding to it this whole time. Yeah. Tell me and describe to me the quadrant, because I loved it and how simple it was to kind of put all of this conversation in perspective so far. Yeah, so um, like there's different like research out there, right? And most of it, um, the three is actually more kind of like a baseline, the like anxious, secure, and avoidant. But typically how it's talked about in the research is there's a continuum of anxious and a continuum of avoidant. So you could be like a little bit on the avoidant scale or a little bit on the anxious scale. Um, just because we're humans, we don't break into four categories. Like, <laughs> yes. you, there's a lot more variance <laughs> in humans. Um, and so, if you think like there's an anxious continuum and an avoidant continuum, and so if you're like high, low on both of them, you're secure. So, you low anxiety, low avoidance, you're secure. Yeah, you come back to the mm -hmm. center of the mm -hmm. quadrant. Well, no, so you're in this little square. This is the secure oh, square okay. that you want to be in. All right. <laughs> this is the goal square. <laughs> Uh, and then if you are low on avoidance and high on anxiety, you're going to be in the anxious. And then kind of opposite, if you are low in anxiety and high on avoidance, you're going to be in the avoidant quadrant. And then if you're high on both, right, a lot of times either you've experienced trauma growing up or had a lot of relational trauma or just other traumas happen in your life, you not only believe I'm bad, you believe others are not trustworthy. So you're constantly, you're like having this need for connection, but also really terrified of it. So you get this like push pull, mm -hmm. like from these people. So these are people if you felt in your life, like they were so excited and ecstatic and they just wanted to be your best friend. And then like a couple weeks later, they just like were totally pushing you away, weren't texting you back. So you're getting mixed signals from mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And when we bring that into a relationship and a sex life, mm -hmm. guess what? <laughs> Trouble. That's, uh, yeah. so correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but is that the connotation of like mm -hmm. fear of intimacy, uh, commitment phobic? Uh, so that would be more like avoidant, mm -hmm. but it would definitely play into the fearful also. I, it, does yeah. it come from the origination of the attachment oh, oh, style? Oh, so the fearful? I don't know where that name comes from. Um, how about like in their childhood, like... Yeah. To gain avoidant mm -hmm. and anxious, you talked a little bit about trauma, yeah. and that can be any type of trauma. Yeah. And that's what lands them in that fourth quadrant? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of times there's either like a chaotic home life or like physical, emotional abuse. The worst kind of emotional abuse is actually like just completely absent. Neglect, neglect. right? Neglect, yeah. yeah. So this could be that of like, no one loved me and also I can't depend on others. So you're learning again, I'm not good, others are not good. Um, and like, I think too, just with our okay, kind of how we're marrying later and marrying more often, I think there's so much relational trauma that happens that could definitely, especially like right after a divorce or right after a big breakup, you could be a little bit more in that fearful spot of like, I mean, feeling bad about yourself mm -hmm. and feeling like the world's not a safe place. Hesita hesitation to do that again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. that's not that's not necessarily where my avoidant attachment mm -hmm. style came from but it was definitely solidified by my own choices mm -hmm. um i chose to go even further on that continuum to avoid it from yeah. childhood trauma yeah. to a first marriage that wasn't pleasant we're good friends now so yeah. um i would enjoy the opportunity to sit mm -hmm. down and actually have this conversation about like hey this is who i was then yeah this is who i am as your daughter's father right now 
you yeah. know? And she's a big fan of the podcast, <laughs> at least on Instagram. I don't know if she listens, <laughs> but she definitely tunes in on Instagram. Yeah. So if you're listening, my daughter's mother is a great mom, and <laughs> it's improved with yeah. my own improvement, too. Yeah. The further closer to that beginning part of that continuum yeah. that I get, everything else in my life improves, too. Mm -hmm. My relationship with my daughter, her mother, and then the new people that I date mm -hmm. um, here in Denver, which happens to be fairly savage. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just got voted again, like the worst place to find love. Or I saw that. Now... Yeah. <laughs> um, we were talking about the push and the pull, and there's yes. a polarity between mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, and I think too, like what what you're talking about, like sometimes with like relationships that end and it is terrible, but then like later on you're fine, is because like you get so ingrained in that pattern, and you're just pushing each other's attachment buttons that it just like gets to a boiling point. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're talking about like an initial relationship, mm -hmm. and then maybe you gather some trauma from that initial relationship. Mm -hmm you carry it for a little while maybe mm -hmm. you get some help with friends family support system or a mm -hmm. counselor which is the route that i went yeah. eventually <laughs> finally right <laughs> hard to get through that door yeah there's a book out there called maybe you should talk to somebody it's so good and there's another book that i was given in my early college years mm -hmm. uh, it's called i don't want to talk about it oh uh -huh. so i don't remember the author but it was very impactful for me yeah so yeah. round one of counseling help for a little while mm -hmm. and then relational trauma and then better counseling now that it's what yeah. 15 years later yeah well and i think that's so true of, like people too that have an avoided attachment style like it's so great when they get into therapy because they're so used that's their defense mechanism but like, i got this i can take care of this like no one else can help me and like mm -hmm. i can figure this out on my own i got mm -hmm. it but the yeah. enneagram types come into play too like mm -hmm. my challenger the eight that's yeah. all i want to do is yeah. i got this i can take care of it mm -hmm. trust no one <laughs> and my, li my lifelong lesson is to understand that being vulnerable will not lead to betrayal. Yeah. Now, how's that paired with an avoidant attachment style? <laughs> and that's where self, yeah. self, or self awareness comes mm -hmm. into play with yeah. using these tools. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, we also have to think like there might be specific buttons that are specifically from our past relationships that really push us. Um, so Maybe infidelity is what you're talking about? Yeah, infidelity, um, like trust things that might come up. Boundaries um, in sex? Boundaries in sex, yeah. So maybe, you know, you've had some, like, sexual trauma, and then you have a partner that will not listen to you at all, um, and they're maybe more avoided, and they don't understand why you need to talk about these things, like mm -hmm. sex is just sex, um, and that can be completely triggering for you. Sure. Yeah. Now, let's talk about compassion just a little bit. This mm -hmm. actually brought up something in my mind of, like, yeah. An anxious attachment style might seek out validation and uh, mm -hmm. um, appreciation or yeah. um, response to sexual health in the relationship mm -hmm. or what. Um, and if somebody is avoidant or secure, they need to know to kind of feed that instead of push that button, right? Kind of yeah. support their partner to what yeah. they need. Yeah. And in a relationship, I think that's why mm -hmm. uh, understanding each other through attachment mm -hmm. style is so important. Yeah. So that maybe like my avoidant attachment style previously mm -hmm. would help an anxious attached when they're needing that validation. Yeah. yeah, I think like definitely like you know your partner is more anxious and like with sex they're feeling really like, comfortable. Even just like having open communication with an anxious person can be like, I'm feeling kind of insecure in our relationship right now and I need to hear this from you. Mm -hmm. Like how great of a conversation would that be if that was to come up? Or if an avoidant person would be like, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed right now, but I want to stick in this with you, but I think I need a little space right now. Like that would look completely different than like, again, pulling on the brakes. Mm -hmm. um, and not to mention like probably one of the healthiest ways to uh, bring up that conversation that yeah. I've ever heard. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and again, especially when it like relates to sex, is like, what are you needing from this right now? Because if you just need orgasm, you can do that by yourself, right? <laughs> like, there's something else that is sex with, like, two different people that, like, there's connection and feeling wanted and needed and, mm -hmm. like, being satisfied with someone else or being satisfied, some, being satisfied by someone else or being able to satisfy someone else. There's something about that two people thing or more than two people. Oh, yeah. Right. And that's the conundrum of what we're trying to figure out yeah. through, um, thankfully the podcast, mm -hmm. but also through our own work too, yeah. individually. And then once we get into a relationship, 
So I've always had this burning question about the first three months of a relationship yeah. and maybe the sex is really hot and heavy mm -hmm. and I do know that anxious and avoidant gravitate to each other mm -hmm. and then at the three month mark something flips. Yeah. What changes? Yeah, well I work with so many clients um, that like once they hit three months or whatever it is for them where it feels more intimate to have sex, it all of a sudden just completely shuts down their sex drive and they no longer want sex. Um, they're feeling really overwhelmed by their partner. They are confused or distressed even why they no longer want to have sex. And they can repeatedly see this happening in every one of their relationships. Um, and then, so might lead to like infidelity or like leaving the relationship because the mm -hmm. spark's gone. Yeah, I would, I would guess um, that leaving the relationship would be more of the result. Yeah. And infidelity, why, is because well, they're self-sustaining, or at least mm -hmm. they, they believe, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, it's the other people that are untrustworthy. So to seek out maybe that um, person outside of a relationship, mm -hmm. help me work through that just a little bit. Yeah. So, well, we can do it from both both sides. Yeah. Um, so for someone who is avoidant, who all of a sudden their sex drive is gone, they're like, there's probably something wrong with this. They're being too needy. They have opened up emotionally to me too much, and I'm just not feeling connected. Like, that's why. Like, they might with other excuses mm -hmm. and so then it's like I want that spark I just want to be able to focus on my needs and have sex with someone mm -hmm. instead of having it be this emotional connection which feels really uncomfortable for me because mm -hmm. you know I don't trust others so like it'd be like like easy to just go and sure. like have sex with someone else you have that spark you're able to just focus on your needs and and you can walk away at any time mm -hmm. yeah and then you know you have that comfortable person to come back to who always needs and wants you so your attachment needs are being met. Got it. And on the anxious yeah. side? Yeah. So With all infidelity? Sudden, yeah. yeah. All of a sudden, your partner who you were hot and heavy for the first three months no longer wants to have sex with you. If you're an anxious person, yeah, that's, that's like, okay. <laughs> that is like, you are now in a tailspin of like, what's wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? Do I need to buy different lingerie? Do I need to buy different toys? Do I need to, do we need to do something different? Um, like, like what is going on in our relationship that they no longer love me? Mm -hmm. Those kind of things. And so I'd be like, they're feeling like their needs aren't getting met and they're feeling like anxious and all of a sudden someone else shows them attention. It's like, oh, this is what I've been missing. Mm -hmm. And uh, really briefly in the, mm -hmm. uh, the quadrant plus the continuum, mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying of like, they shift in response mm -hmm. to their partner's behavior in yeah. the bedroom yeah and then they can move in the quadrant too yeah right yeah. along that continuum yeah so it can be even like they're still in the anxious category but it just looks completely different they go further away mm -hmm. from like the, 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 the pendulum points. swing <laughs> oh my gosh like you just like both go yeah <laughs> i i in your in your story i can even just track through my life of the avoidant yeah. half of the pendulum swing just being mm -hmm. so far away from secure yeah and that's why i was mm -hmm. dealing with anxiety and depression my whole yeah. life in my relationships. Mm -hmm. In my personal life, of course, there's reasons to experience anxiety and depression too. Yeah. Which can be exasperated by a relationship. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's what, like, too, like, what makes couples therapy great, because a lot of times some people don't want to come in for individual, but they're like, okay, I'll do couples. Is Because they're strongly encouraged to do so by their partner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Usually, typically, the partner that's more anxious gets the avoidant to tag along. Um, <laughs> Uh, or the avoidant who's like had it with their anxious partner needing so much is like, let's go talk to someone else. Um, <laughs> but like research shows that like couples therapy actually lowers depression and anxiety and PTSD. And even if you don't even touch that with a couple, if you don't even touch any of the mental health stuff, like just the relationship building, mm. like can help lower all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Solid. So let's wrap it up okay. with um, a little bit of. We got so off track. That's quite all right. <laughs> uh, let's talk more about that fearful quadrant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like um, high on the anxious and mm -hmm. high on the avoidant continuum. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do we adjust and experience that in a positive way mm -hmm. uh, with, with our partner sexually and in, in a relationship too? Yeah, yeah. So this is like an important, especially like 
for couples therapists to know or just for like you to know too because you could be thinking and even like adjusting okay my partner is a little bit more distancing and when I need attention I need to ask for it in this way and like you learn how to like move around it but all of a sudden they flip scripts on you <laughs> and so like the pursuer distancer it could be like oh this person's pursuing and then all of a sudden it like flips and the uh -huh. other person's pursuing uh -huh. we can get really confused <laughs> especially if you've like okay I'm figuring out this person I know how to interact I know how to ask for my needs and then it will switch around um, and again like this person has been told that the world is not safe and that I cannot consistently count on others and like people have rejected me a lot so I have I don't feel good about myself so if I don't feel good and they don't feel good uh -huh. um, then a lot of times it is like it's this like flipping of the switch so it could be that like they maybe are using sex to get a lot of attention and like feeling really like needed and sexy and good about themselves and then their like button gets switched and they're like oh my gosh I am feeling comfortable with this person like what does that mean mm -hmm. like what's gonna happen when's their shoe gonna drop and so then all of a sudden they're like pushing away they don't want to have sex like you could get that back and forth and leaving that partner who we don't know where else they are in the quadrant just feeling completely confused about what's happening yeah so I think that's the piece is like that partner just is like left completely confused mm -hmm. about what that means, what their partner actually wants. Um, and that other person is just on a like roller coaster of their own too. Yeah. And we'll, we'll kind of wrap this up here in a second with another quick question that's come to mind. But before we do, what's the best way for the, our audience to get a hold of you if your message resonates with them today? Yeah, so you can go to centersharedinsight.com and go ahead and give us a call. Um, as you said, all three of us at this practice, Dr. Hick, Dr. Blake, and I all do this all day long. We love talking about mm -hmm. it. I go home and talk to my friends about it. It's just all the time. Uh, so you can call and schedule an appointment to meet with one of us if you're thinking you want to start like being more aware of that pendulum swing that's <laughs> going on for you um, to keep you more, more centered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if there's one thing that we didn't get to or that we touched on briefly that you want to expand on, what would that be? I think we didn't really go into like how also just cultural context can influence sex for us. Um, and if people feel shame around sex, if they feel um, like masculine, feminine, there's a lot of roles that come into that. And there's a lot of times, again, like men have this like with like traditional masculinity that they're this performance constantly. And so if they are more avoidant and they're feeling shaky about their performance, they're gonna push away. And if they're anxious and they're feeling insecure about their performance, they're gonna amp up. Um, and then women with anxious and avoidant attachment styles, women with more avoidant attachment styles might use sex more of like getting my needs met, distancing, I don't wanna be intimate. Um, I look great, you're fine, like whatever, let's just have sex. Um, someone who's anxious might have a lot more like body image issues and maybe there is some shame around it or yeah, again, so just also not only knowing your attachment but just how different things in your life have impacted you. What are your views on sex? Was it talked about growing up? Was it not talked about? Was there like a shaming incident? Like we have so much baggage around sex too that influences it. And what I want, thank you so very much for that. Uh, what I want our audience to understand is that there's hope. Yes. That I am proof of understanding where it comes from, what it is, and what to do about it. Yeah, yeah, I think, and especially even if they're listening to this, like they're they're doing the work. Like, so know, it could be a first step. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, you know, we are gonna have plenty of relationship opportunities where we're gonna learn a lot and <laughs> maybe not the best relationship opportunity but we have room to learn and we're always if we think about who we were like 10 years ago in our sex lives it probably looks a lot different than where we are now and people in their like 60s also report some of the highest sexual satisfaction so good looking up all right <laughs> later years are you trying to say i'm creeping up on 60. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> i'm just saying that like in the as you get older too you get more confidence and you're able to have these type of conversations and that's going to increase Sexual satisfaction. So. There's all, definitely hope. You don't I'm have to wait till you're 60, though, to have good sex. I know, I'm 39. <laughs> you're not, you're not a ways away. <laughs> and I just came out of my midlife crisis. Good, and... good. <laughs> so you're right on track for great sex. Totally. <laughs> 
not accepting applications at this time. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. That m might have I'm been... I'm blushing right now if you can't tell. <laughs> that might have been a slightly avoidant attachment style statement right there. <laughs> I am not accepting applications at this time. I know time. that I'm great, but like, can you seriously back off? <laughs> So my avoidant attachment style, now that we're talking about it, is like social media comes into play in our lives mm -hmm. all the time, right? Yeah. When, when Center for Shared Insight connects with me on, mm -hmm. on social media, that's a positive way of the, of the tool mm -hmm. being used. Like we're bouncing and we're pinging back mm -hmm. and forth. But I, I met this girl in person. I'm going to do a little self-disclosure. I hope that's all right with you guys. I think they like it. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I met this girl, uh, she was coordinating a workout at Red Rocks or something mm -hmm. like that, and I took a friend of mine, a female friend of mine, who's in the personal training world, mm -hmm. and we were building a relationship and we were having a lot of fun around workouts together. Mm -hmm. So we went to this Red Rocks workout together, met the host one time, and then stayed connected on Instagram and Facebook mm -hmm. from then on out. And I get the invite to her birthday party, reach out and say, thank you so much for the invite mm -hmm. to your birthday party. Just FYI, where's it gonna be? Oh, at this location? I don't drink much, but I, I still know how to have a good time. Mm -hmm. And then nothing. I didn't even, I didn't get, I didn't get the details of like time and day, right? <laughs> was this really an invite? Or? It, was, it was kind of an invite, you know? <laughs> and I gave my number so that mm -hmm. she could reach me because mm -hmm. I'm not on social media on Friday through Sunday. So it was gonna be a Friday night. And I'm like, oh, I don't, didn't hear from you, that's fine. You know, I was single at the time. <clears throat> didn't have anything invested. And then a few weeks go by. This is where my avoidant attachment style is like, <laughs> buttons pushed, right? A few weeks go by and I get this random Facebook message in my inbox and it says, hey Dave, I just wanna let you know that I was interested in dating you and then when you told me that you weren't drinking, um, that's actually a really big deal to me that I can have drinks with my partner. Um, so, which is I'm, also not what you said, but definitely not, right? <laughs> um, and we can track that because it's Facebook Messenger <laughs> saves everything, right? And and it came down to like, um, so I just didn't want to, you know, send you any mixed signals about dating. Mm -hmm. And I th I was like, I don't know what just happened here. Mm -hmm. Were were we dating? And then my avoidant attachment style kicks in and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, Way to be presumptive there. I'm good. <laughs> We're gonna take a step back here. You know, and I, yeah. I clearly explained it. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry if I sent you mixed signals yeah. in the last nine months or whatever. Yeah. I haven't seen you since the beginning of the year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, I, I, I don't know where that message came from. I apologize. That was also, don't you always wonder like what's happening in that person's life that made them send that message at that moment? So you're the helper on the Enneagram, right? Yes. And uh, we didn't touch on the helper, a little bit on the, uh, mm -hmm. the challenger, but one of the tendencies of the helper is mm -hmm. to perceive the needs of another person. Mm -hmm. And you may think at some point, oh, I really feel the need to share this with another person, mm -hmm. verbally, text message, email, or something like that, yeah. to kind of, kind of, handle it for yourself take it off of your plate or your conscience or something yeah. like that yeah and that's why I love the Enneagram so much is yeah. like I'm not assuming that she's a two or the helper mm -hmm. but that could be where that comes yeah. from in a personality tendency yeah yeah but there had been something that like sparked it like you had to like post something on Instagram or like she got up the courage or she's talking to a girlfriend like I really should let him down <laughs> softly <laughs> And this is uh, this is a big reason why boundaries are so important mm -hmm. for me is like yeah. you know what we're gonna have a more reasonable boundary with you mm -hmm. from here on out maybe I yeah. maybe I won't like as much of your stuff on social media mm -hmm. so that I'm not paying attention to you yeah. and, and giving you mixed signals at all yeah. okay what was my behavior in this situation <laughs> and now that I'm straight up avoiding attachments yeah <laughs> but I hear that so often too with people of like um, like, I feel like there's so many memes of this, too, of, like, you, like, they don't text you back, and then they watch your Instagram story. Oh, the Orbiter? Yeah. yeah. Is that what that's, that's called? That's what it's called, yeah. I love that. I, 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 I've yeah. seen Orbiters. Or, like, they'll message uh, yeah. you on Instagram, but then they never text you. Or, like, there's just, like, weird yeah. things that end up happening with... So that's a really funny point, actually. I've recognized that in the last 18 months or so of my text message thread inbox 
is less active than my Instagram inbox mm -hmm. because that's where my audience is for building yeah. my business is, yeah. right? And that's where I'm engaging with people regularly because I'm not dating multiple people at the same time. Mm -hmm. So therefore my inbox isn't filling up like yeah. say like a serial dater would yeah. or uh, somebody who's very active on apps. They're gonna have a lot of messages. Yeah. And I think maybe the apps have a lot to do with that Instagram interaction as well is because I mean, it's loosely categorized that the dating apps are social media mm -hmm. by our phones. Yeah. And then, well, it's a, it's kind of an attachment to our cell phone as well to go from a mm -hmm. dating app. Oh, well, let me check my Instagram mm -hmm. right away. Yeah. And my audience was interacting with me on Instagram mm -hmm. and not my text message thread. So yeah, I totally, I totally yeah. picked up on that too. I feel like that is something new that like people aren't asking for your number. They're asking for your Instagram handle. I'm just right. like... Okay. <laughs> hey, I'm totally transparent yeah. on Instagram. Um, like, I'm happy to give that out because there are four things that I talk about on Instagram. My personal page, but it's still used for business. My dog, my daughter, um, fitness and nutrition, and jujitsu. Yeah. I mean, like, there's really nothing <laughs> super personal there. I haven't yeah. posted a, a picture of me with a significant other in yeah. two years. What do you think would happen with all of your like followers and things like that? If you were to post a picture with you and a girl, they would blow up. <laughs> I think I think I have a I think that my community is full of avoidant attachment style. Um, because like it's crickets if I were to do that. Oh really? Um, however, the community that I'm just making a joke here, guys. Don't take that too personally. Because um, I love you all so much. Um, our community is so supportive of what's going on personally. Like mm -hmm. they, they support the podcast professionally and they're just like yeah. share, 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 share mm -hmm. and it's getting a lot of traction and I love that. But when I needed to reach out to that community today, mm -hmm. I briefly explained to you why earlier, their support to me and I haven't yeah. met these people in person. Yeah. Like because we use social media in a mm -hmm. healthful, appropriate way, mm -hmm. we have boundaries with these people and they're like, Dave, what do you need? I'm here for you. Just, I'm giving you a virtual hug right now. Yeah. You know? Aww. Yeah. It makes it, again, I think that like social media and internet can get really demonized, but if we're using it in a perfect way to build connection, mm -hmm. like that's what my, so my thesis was on social media use. And it's like people who are anxious use it to get all the likes. Attention. Sure. Right. And people who are avoidant just like kind of like passively look through the internet. Sure. And they people, might not even post that frequently either. They, they won't like, they won't post. They're just watching other people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, and then who are secure use it to build up in-person relationships. I uh, totally get that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So what do you say in the next six to 12 months we invite you back and we have that social media conversation yeah. from a perspective of attachment or just a perspective of 2019, soon to be 2020. I mean, Shh, don't say that. I know it's freaking <laughs> me out too. <laughs> too soon. It's <laughs> weird to think that 2000 is 20 years ago. Right. Now you just know. blew my mind, right? <laughs> now we're all sad. It's okay. <laughs> we're getting close to the 60. It's fine. Just remember, better sex on the horizon. Oh, God. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate yeah. your time. This was fantastic. Yeah, thanks for having me on. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That was hilarious. Nicely done. Whew. How do you feel? I'm all 